Janet, I understand that you started out your career as a script reader at New Line. Right. <laughs> you did your research. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you did your research. I'm impressed. I sure did. Okay. I was in graduate school at NYU, and um, I was totally surprised to figure out that I had a knack for a story, and in that I, I had a knack for giving notes. And so somebody told me, you know, you can make money doing this. There are people who will pay you to read scripts and books and give you your, your opinions. I thought, oh my God, I can't believe I just hit pay dirt. Somebody will pay me to spout my opinions. So I started to read scripts around town at a variety of places, uh, one of which was this tiny company. Their offices were next door to the Port Authority in Times Square, New York, which is really at the time grungy and kind of dangerous. And there's really eccentric people there, and they had released the John Waters movies, and there were all these kind of like hippies running it, and I loved it. <laughs> so, um, so I started to read scripts for them, and um, this lovely woman who was sort of second in command of the company called me in, and her name was Sarah Risher. And she said, you know, we've got so many screenplays now submitted to us because we've just produced a movie that we're finishing and word is out that, you know, might be pretty good. And so we're getting a lot of scripts and I can't handle them. And I looked in the corner and there was a stack up to here that's about to fall down. And so I became the first ever in-house reader. I worked off the books part-time a few days a week while I was going to grad school. And of course, that first film was released and it was Nightmare on Elm Street, the company's New Line Cinema. It was Sarah Risher and Bob Shea, and uh, it was just a handful of us who were working together next to the Port Authority. And it was a very exciting time. This was the late 80s, and um, what they used to call off-Hollywood movies were exploding. And so I was very fortunate for the next 10 years to grow up at New Line. It was a, a decade of tremendous personal and professional growth for me. And so I remained at New Line and grew as the company grew and went from being a freelance, part-time, off-the-books, first-ever script reader to setting up their first story department to being their first director of acquisitions to eventually becoming the senior VP of production in the New York office. Um, Sarah and Bob and Mike DeLuca, we had all been working together, went out to the West Coast and set up the LA office and I stayed home and was very committed to New York independent films and the creative fecundity of what was coming out of New York and the culture and um, because we were in New York City and we were riding the subways, um, unlike our peers who were going from their cars to their offices to their screening rooms, we knew that hip hop was happening. We were there on the street and it was all around us. And so when Reggie Hedlund came in with an idea for a movie, he was straight out of college and he had made a short film, House Party, I knew and my team knew this was it. And um, I remember <laughs> um, FedExing out a magazine about hip hop to explain to them this is a cultural trend, this is happening. And, um, and of course they listened and we made house party and that went on to be, you know, history and it was a really exciting, wonderful time and Newland was such a creative place and we were so encouraged, Bob Shea just encouraged us to express ourselves and explore and bring things to the table and I was having a great time. What did the cultural cues then teach you about where um, youth or let's say the 18 to 34 demographic was at that time? Because I find that fascinating. Here you were riding the subway and you picked up on so much more about the current culture than somebody that was going right from their garage into the garage of their work. Well, I think that's the big advantage of being a New Yorker. Um, I am back in New York full time. I was in LA for many years actually raising my child. I wasn't working during the years that I was here in LA. Um, it's a little tangential, but my son, of course, is on the spectrum of autism, and LA is an epicenter for autism treatments. And so uh, this ended up being a fantastic environment that was really beneficial to him. And so, you know, I raised him for 10 years here. But I'm very happy to be back in New York because it's a... There's a vitality, an energy, a de democratic intermingling there that I love and feeds me. And, you know, we're all New Yorkers first. 
we all bump up against each other. We all ride the subways together. We all are, you know, elbowing into the deli to get our morning coffee together. There's a way that the community of New York is larger and ultimately really kind of unites us. And so of course there's divisions. I don't need to be a romantic idiot, but um, there's just a way that there's a kind of a natural multiculturalism in New York uh, that creates a lot of um, interesting art. Mm -hmm. Going back to your position at New Line, it sounds like you almost created a job for yourself. Was it, was that already one that was sort of a job description? Or yeah, did no. you kind of weave your way in? Yeah, mm -hmm. no, I definitely did. What happened was that the company was a, it was a tiny skeletal structure. And as the company grew and its needs grew, it became clear that there were areas that needed to be developed. And so I was very supported in the suggestions that I made, you know, and it became clear, hey, we really need to have a story department and we need to have a way to log these scripts and we need to hire some freelance readers to work with me, that, that they understood. So, and then when I started to go around to film festivals and look at movies and it became clear, hey, you know, we really need to just have an area of acquisitions that's looking in conjunction with the people who are reading the scripts separately from them, they understood because it's not like I was making this stuff up. I was seeing other companies doing it and we were all tumbling around together. This is the other part that was extremely exciting is who was my peer group. This was a time that Miramax, that Bob and Harvey were forming Miramax and there was um, Ira Deutschman at a company called Cinecom and of course the Sony Classics guys and there were a lot of people who we were all sort of in doing this together and going to the festivals together and these were the first years of the Sundance Film Festival and watching what we were all doing and you know being friendly competitors sometimes not so friendly but in it together really growing something up and um, so I was picking up cues and bringing information back to the fold you know. So then in hindsight, what do you think those 10 years, whatever it was, taught you about the business? Like, you know, it's sort of from a broad yeah. view. Oh, well, absolutely everything. I knew nothing. I knew nothing when I started working at New Line. I was, you know, in my early 20s, I was a grad student and I just liked stories. I knew nothing about the industry, filmmaking, thinking about market shares and audience and business and and it was a very good discipline. I think what it taught me first and foremost is to be accountable and responsible. That as a storyteller you can tell whatever story you want but you have to know who you're speaking to. You have to know how is your story offering something new and who wants to hear it. And then to realistically assess how many of those people want to hear this story and budget accordingly as opposed to some creative artistic entitlement, you know, I've got a great vision and I should be given money like from a de Medici, you know. Rather, hey, this is, um, you're asking somebody to invest in a business venture. You're asking somebody to give you a whole heck of a lot of money to say something, be responsible for that, be responsible to that, and assess it accurately. And I think that that's the, that kind of a paradigm of, um, reality-based respectful consideration of everybody's part that everybody is working together it's not like the big bad money guy and the mean distributor everybody's the same goal to tell stories and to share them with an audience now how are we all going to make that work together and being mutually respectful that everybody's coming to the table with the same goal different points of view on it how can we the more that you understand everybody's point of view the better off everybody will be and you'll be as a storyteller so for me the fantastic discipline that we had that was really unique um, was that at New Line, unlike many other more traditionally organized studios, the, um, the production division wasn't isolated. The way it worked is that it was more like we were functioning like independent producers within the company. Here's how. So if I had a project that I was passionate about, like for example, House Party, I had to take the project to the guy who's the head of marketing the guy was head of distribution, the guy was head of the ancillary media, DVD at that time, uh, VCR, mm -hmm. uh, the guy was head of foreign and say, here's the project, what's it worth to you? What's it worth to you? What's it worth to you? How can you sell it? What do you think the audience is? Bring it back and see if that justified the budget. And then you'd go into a meeting with Bob and say, here's my numbers, here's their numbers, does it make sense or not? 
It was very disciplined and I got to learn a lot and think like they thought. So it was like going to producer school, which of course is incredibly important as a filmmaker. We don't exist in isolation. I am wildly against the prototype of the indulged artist, you know, who sits on a pedestal and is like a Pasha carried forth, you know. No, we're in this together in a, a collaborative medium where it's very important to understand what everybody is doing, why they're doing it, and work together. So I think that's the biggest thing that I learned, you know, healthy respect. How can someone know if they have auteur entitlement syndrome? Because I think in this day and age, especially with the wonderful term of the artist entrepreneur, yeah. and now so much of this is in our own hands, how do we check our own egos and our own expectations? Yeah. I actually think that artist entrepreneur um, causes you to be disciplined. Because if you're the one who's building it, you're the one who's raising money, you're the one who's gonna find out right away whether you've got a story that other people want to hear. And you're the one who's going to realize, hey, five people want to hear it, I better bring my budget down. So I think that entrepreneur part of that moniker is the most important antidote to the auteur entitlement. The auteur entitlement presupposes the artist who's in a pedestal preserved from, right, in this kind of perfect bubble where they can think and create, you know, sort of protected from the sullying voice of the business, as opposed to the entrepreneur who is a business person, who's saying, I've got a business venture, and I'm going to ask people to invest in it, and how am I going to express my art within a business model that makes sense? So I think that is the antidote. Interesting. You know, I hear you speak so much about business and numbers and marketing, but I also hear that you have an emotional intelligence that's very high as well. Um, and, and I don't know if you've been told that, but, but how do you bring that to your work and how does that play out? You have a high Well, I, I'm, IQ. I'm first emotional IQ. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, I had to learn <laughs> this stuff, right? Uh -huh. It was disciplining my emotional emotionality, and which was so helpful. I think as an artist, we often work best against limitations. You know, that, that some, it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole idea that when you're, writing poetry to have to discipline yourself to write the poetic forms, you know, um, will then give you so much more shape when you're doing more free form. That limitations force us to um, refine and define our vision and develop skill and craft, you know. So here's the thing. You can be a craftsperson without being an artist, but you can't be an art artist without knowing your craft. And so the task of making art requires, it demands, Aristotle talks about this in his Poetics, it requires that we be right brain and left brain. As Aristotle talks about it, he talks about the madman and the analytical mind, that we have to you know, give ourselves over to being the maniac you know, who just feels and feels, and then we have to stop and look at it and analyze and ask rigorous questions of our work to give it that shape and craft. And I think that craft extends to all of these aspects of reaching your audience. It's all part of the craft, the craft of physically producing, the craft of directing, the craft of creating the, the beautiful, glorious, symmetrical machine that is your movie, your story. And then the craft of relating to audience and now with this exciting, dynamic, digital world, direct to fan distribution, speaking to your audience directly, crowdsourcing, raising money from them directly. That's craft. That's a discipline. That's knowing how to organize your vision into something that is clear to others so that they participate with you. And that's, that's rigorous and, um, and requires that we are emotional and analytical both. You really need both if you're gonna make art. Janet, I'd heard you interviewed on in another show that was about um, autism, mm -hmm. and, and you said something that's interesting that applies in, in so many aspects, and that is part of being a well-adjusted adult is knowing what your limitations are. And, mm -hmm. and, and I think a lot of us um, go into certain ideas of what we want or, or, or chase after certain things. Yeah. And I'm wondering how do we weave that into you know filmmaking? I mean, you work at, at Tisch and you deal with students, mm -hmm. and we all have an idea 
of who we want to be. Once right. we leave college, we all have an idea of who we want to be by 30, by 40, and yeah. then on. So how do we reconcile right. what our limitations are and knowing what our strengths are and what they'll never be? Because I think sometimes yeah. that's, that's half the battle of then knowing where to direct your energy. There's not an easy answer to that one. It's called growing up. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a lifelong process of, um, you know, in Buddhism, there's um, uh, an idea of, you know, preferences. What are, we, what are we attaching to? What is our willfulness that's attaching to certain preferences that is impeding our ability to see what's in front of us today, right now, and embrace it. And I think that's the task of being an integrated human adult, period, full stop in all aspects. What's in front of you? Who are you in relationship? And, and how are you showing up for right here and now? Because past is history, future is fantasy. It's right here and now. What's actually happening? as opposed to what I must make of it, what I must see, what I require and demand it to be, what I am furiously disappointed that it is not. Now, when you have a child with special needs, you come crashing up against that right away. This is what's in front of you. This is who your child actually is. Are you going to open your eyes to it, accept and rise to the challenge of who this actual child is, what this actual child really needs, what this person in front of you, not your idea, your imposition, your fantasy, your disappointment, your frustration, your rage, no. So when you're a parent and you get the diagnosis that your child is has autism, you know the brain is most plastic zero to age three, continues to be somewhat plastic till age 10, radical drop off after that. Now we now know happily brain is plastic till death, but there's a radical drop off. Okay, so you get the diagnosis. Clock is running, meter's ticking. You can save your child's life or you can have your feelings about it. That's not a choice. So you just have to accept. You just have to let that go. Let all that ego intention and will and desire and preference go and show up. And that's a powerful practice. That's a powerful discipline, it's a powerful practice. And actually is what allowed me to become an artist. I had self-sabotaged. When I was in my 20s, I felt insecure, insignificant as a woman. I didn't see myself modeled or reflected as a storyteller. I didn't believe that I had relevancy. I didn't believe that it really mattered for me to say anything. And after you go through the process of raising a child with this level of need, all that dross burns away and who I am and my right to be who I am just became obvious and I didn't have to struggle for it anymore I just was it and I just stepped into that and um, that's how I'm here now talking to you really and how I happened to make Jack of the Red Hearts and fly away the film before it and um, and I hope more you also did a documentary, I think, about autism. I was one music. of the producers. Okay. I did not direct. Right. I was one of the producers, a team of people that made Autism the Musical that I'm very proud of, which aired on HBO and got two Emmys and very proud of it. And then after that, I wrote and directed my first feature called Fly Away, which is still available on iTunes and Amazon, okay. um, which is a very sort of personal story about mm. a mother contending with her adult child's... I'm sorry contending with her teenage child's adult future yeah. and her child has autism. And because of that, the producers of Jack the Red Hearts saw that and brought me the script and we came together to collaborate and it was really great. I was yes. really lucky. I was going to ask you who Jennifer Deaton. Yes. Had you met her before? No. Okay. No. Can you talk about how you were introduced to her? Yeah. So, you know, this is funny because it kind of goes back to New Line. Um, my boss and mentor at New Line was Sarah Risher, a wonderful woman. And she met Lucy Muckerjee, an independent producer who had joined forces with Jennifer Deaton to produce their passion project. And Jennifer is the aunt of a child with severe autism and was inspired to write this story, Jack of the Red Hearts. And they had no backing, no funding, just a lot of drive and passion. Lucy met Sarah and Sarah said, huh, you're looking for a director, have you seen Fly Away? So she introduced them uh, to my work. They approached me, I read the script, thought it was you know, excellent and most importantly, authentic. Um, we started to collaborate together and then Lucy was very fortunate to be introduced to a company in New York, Sundial, 
Stefan Nowicki and Joey Carey, who are wonderful guys. They read the script overnight and signed on. And, you know, I think this is important to say, too. There's so much conversation, and I'm a big participant in the conversation about gender parity in filmmaking. It's incredibly important. This is a very important moment where we, as women, step forward to tell our stories. But we can't do it alone, and we need men to help us. And these guys didn't even think about it as a story by, for, and about women. They read it as a human story. Gender blind, they just responded to it without even skipping a beat. And we came together and had a great experience making it. It came together very quickly. We were so lucky to get a brilliant cast. And um, and a really kind of a seamless collaboration. Any challenges making the film? Oh, there's challenges every day in making a film. Making a film is hard. It's hard. <laughs> you're up against the light. You're up against, you know, a prop that's not there. Or you're up against, you know, all of the human error. Um, but you get through it. And you pull together and, you know, steady as she goes. I'm a real believer in calm, steady, focused. Everybody is showing up to problem solve. If you're spewing anxiety and agitation, that's only going to make it worse. I know I can't problem solve if somebody's all angry and agitated. I can't be creative if somebody is throwing that kind of static my way. So I'm not going to throw it their way. Just keep it calm. Stay focused. You're going to figure it out together. And by the way, this is something I think is also the advantage of having been, you know, raised my child is that, okay, so you're missing a, a key light. That's not a crisis. A crisis is when your child is up at 3 a.m. having a raging tantrum and you haven't slept for five weeks. That's a crisis. This is just a problem. This can get solved. Okay, so there we all were tumbling around New York, inventing and clawing out the indie film movement. And um, so New Line was in this kind of big loft space right next to the Port Authority, and we actually had all of our films there. So we had the film transport office in the back, and there was this kid who was the film inspector. He was a student at an NYU, and he'd come after school and would inspect all of the films to make sure that everything you know, was in the can. And we started talking, I thought, wow, he's really smart. So at this point, there were so many scripts that I was reading, I couldn't handle it all, and so I thought, Hey, maybe he'd be my first read. He'd help me out. So he started to read scripts for me. This was Ted Hope. Wow. So Ted and I were just, you know, children together. Now, meantime, I was meeting all the young producers who had fire in their belly, and there was this guy who was really smart, and he'd come from Stanford, and he had this wide-ranging appetite, everything from, you know, cartoons to high art. He was just the most generously democratic appreciator and great taste and he was hungry to produce so he started to read scripts for me this was James Seamus and I was talking to James about his taste and talking to Ted about his taste and realizing they had a lot in common so I said I think you guys should meet you should produce together so I introduced them and they created Good Machine wow. so this was an exciting time where this was who was in our this is my peer group right we were all figuring it out together any parallels between then and now in terms of any type of a shift? I think that you're always finding groups of committed, ambitious young artists and film is a collaborative medium. So you're always finding people who are exciting each other, igniting each other, stimulating each other, and collaborating together. That is the nature of film. Nobody does this on their own. Nobody does this alone. And so I see now students coming out of NYU forming collectives. Now the internet is a content creation machine. So there's all kinds of opportunities for students who are coming out of NYU where they've made films together in class and now they form production companies and they do branded content that's essentially short films that are showing their craft and exercising their skills while they're making that film that's going to be the Sundance winner. It's a really exciting moment. What are one of the number one maybe fears or, or, or sort of doubts in the minds of a lot of the students that you're talking to today? I think that what everybody's concerned about is that there's this tsunami wave of content. There's an overabundance of content. And how do you emerge? How, I mean, after you've been making your YouTube videos, uh, what's next? Now, back in the 90s, there was, it was a lot harder 
there were fewer opportunities, there was much less access. Films were shot on celluloid. There were a handful of distributors, only one or two festivals that was interested in indie films. So it kind of winnowed out a lot, but it also meant that if you did something of quality, there was a clear route and people would see you. Whereas today, would they find you? It's the same question people ask if the Beatles you know, put their music up on Pandora or whatever, would anybody notice them? And that's a real concern. How do people emerge? And I don't have any answer. I mean, I think it's about this generation is going to have to figure it out. That's what I say to my students. It's on you now. You know, we got you to this point. You're going to have to form your own future. And they will. They will.